bless you. Father, we thank you again for your covering, Lord. We thank you, Father, that there's nothing that surprises you, Lord, and that for every temptation, every trap, every way, that you have provided a way of redemption, a way of refuge, a way of rescue. Father, we seek more understanding, and we seek power and deliverance and spiritual power this morning to overcome. We thank you for it, Lord. Lead us, Holy Ghost. You do it, Lord, unto your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> well, as you know, the theme that I sent out that the Lord put very heavily in my spirit was there must be some way out of here. And of course, for those of you who, who uh, either like that or know that from the older days, or uh, it's been revived a lot and people have redone it. It was a Jimi Hendrix lyric from a, an album he did called Watchtower. And actually, uh, Sonny and I were discussing, there's some very uh, interesting themes and verses in there. So no doubt he was seeking and struggling. But there is some way out of there. And I was thinking about an old story uh, that's been used. In fact, there was a book that was written. Some of you might have had it. It was a very small little book, and it had its day a few years back, and it was about Benaia. Benaia. Say Benaia. Benaia. And Benaia, we read about in, uh, in the book of Samuel and in Chronicles, and he's one of those sub-characters. Um, he's not one of the, he didn't make the uh, hero hall of fame, in Hebrews, and uh, he wasn't even one of the top three uh, people in David's uh, kingdom uh, as regards his army and his military, but yet he's quite an interesting character. He, uh, his history is that he ended up uh, heading up the secret service, if you would say, for David, and uh, he was honored among David's mighty men in 2 Samuel 23, 23. He was put over his bodyguards. And, of course, we know David needed bodyguards at that time. They were trying to kill him. Um, he commanded David's mercenary forces. So that would be like those that are paid for by the governments and sent out to go do some guerrilla work and other issues and to fight battles uh, that are being paid for it that aren't necessarily the army. That was coming out of uh, First Chronicles as well. His father was a priest. So he came with a, a strong background of faith and understanding of the Lord, which means he was a Levite. So he also understood praise and worship, and, uh, but yet he was a, a, a fighter. He was a descendant of Aaron. Aaron. His grandfather was a valiant man, too, it tells us, who came from a town of Kabzil. And uh, we don't really know anything else about his grandfather other than that Apparently, Benaiah got a lot of genes. There was a big gene pool in his life. And one of the things we see is that God prepared him. And for some reason, this is the book that we talked about, that little book that came out some years back. And it was, you know, chasing, uh, falling into a pit with a lion on a wintry day. And uh, that was Benaiah. And uh, for some reason or another, he was pursuing a lion. Now, I can only imagine that, you know, I remember a story my father told me when he was in the China-Burma-India theater in World War II, and, and he was in that theater that was warring against the Japanese, and a big uh, tiger came into the camp, and it actually killed one of the, uh, one of the Chinese uh, regulars that was in the camp, and dragged them out so they knew that they had a man-eating tiger. They were waiting for this tiger, and they went out and pursued him and got him before he came back in again. They killed the tiger, and I'm sure they did it with, uh, with weapons and, and uh, not with their bare hands or with a spear or a sword. But Benaiah went after this lion, so I could only pursue that, perceive that this lion was a threat somehow, and he wanted to get rid of it. And it was a wintry day, so it was slippery. And there was ice, and there was some snow. And the lion fell into a pit and was down in the pit. And it says that Benaiya went into the pit after the lion. Now, it's interesting because when you really break it down, I'm not so sure that he intended to actually go into the pit. 
I think he got too close to the pit, and it was a wintry, slippery day, and he ended up sliding into the pit. Well, guess what happened? Once he was in the pit, there was a battle, and it was he and the lion. And so his fame was that he killed a lion on a wintry day in a pit. And uh, interesting, because right after that, he had another assignment, and it tells us that uh, he killed two Moabite heroes. And that also comes out of 2 Samuel 23. And it's a little bit of a, of a word play. So there was some guy whose name was Ariel, and he had two sons. And Benaniah killed them, and it says that they were lion-like. So chances are they were hairy, and uh, they probably were, had a lot of dexterity, and they were pretty good fighters. So just like David was prepared by the Lord to first of all pursue that which stole his lamb. And uh, he ended up going after the lion, and he ended up going after the bear, and then eventually he fought Goliath, didn't he? Well, Benaniah had his own training uh, responsibilities, and he ended up warring against these two. Then the Lord increased it a little more, and he went against a seven-foot Egyptian giant. And this giant, it said, had a huge spear. And the spear was so big that a normal person couldn't pick it up. But somehow, Benaniah snatched the spear from him and slayed him with his own spear, this Egyptian giant. Finally, after all of that, uh, David had asked Solomon, his son, who ended up, as we know, receiving the kingdom from his father. He became Solomon's trusted general, Benaniah. Now, there's not much about him. You only read five, six verses, mostly about it. But I want to focus on the fact that he found himself in a pit with a lion on a slippery, wintry day. And because he was in that trap, he only had one thing to do, and that was to fight and then to get out of it. I want you to know that, as I said when we were worshiping, that we have a Redeemer. And our Redeemer, every fabric of his spiritual nature is to redeem, to restore, and to reconcile. He can do nothing less. His heart and his compassion is not to judge and destroy. In fact, what he says is, I present you to the Father, fear the one whom after you have died, can cast you into hell. Jesus doesn't even want to be in that position to cast people into hell. He so, the Lord so loved the world that he gave his son, his only son, that he might die and redeem all. Interesting that everyone, whomsoever shall call upon his name for salvation, is saved. Whomsoever. It sort of lets us know what the fabric, the purpose, the nature, the personality and the total function of Christ is as our intercessor, and an intercessor for the world. For him, any soul that slips through and is not saved is a failure. For him, that's a drop of blood that was wasted. For him, it's a situation and a problem that did not get reconciled, and so he grieves with that. And likewise, besides souls, he cares about you in your darkest hour. How many of us can say that we have experienced at least one very dark hour in our life. How many can say we've had more than one? How many might say that right now you're struggling in a dark hour? Something is, uh, uh, is askew. It's just not right, is it? And you've wondered what's going on. Well, you know, there's something that happens as we persist through a difficult time. And negativity begins to creep in. Not only negativity, but doubt. And the challenge is not to live in the present situation that you're in. The challenge is for us to, even if we're in the dark, is to see the light. And to begin to thank God and praise God for that light. To praise Him for that praise and that release, for that deliverance. We talked about Paul and Silas being in the prison. We talked about the fact that they didn't deserve to be there. They didn't do any crime. They were ruthlessly beaten, savagely. They had really no hope because the next day, the intent was to try to destroy and kill them. They were supposed to stay in prison. But yet, 
they did the only thing they could do, being in that trap and in that darkest place of all, the dungeon, looking at each other's wounds, bleeding. They began to praise, and they began to thank God. They began to worship. And something happened in the midst of their psalm, an interesting underscore, the midnight hour, at the point when it was at its darkest apex on the clock. The midnight hour. At the hour when probably if there was anybody else in earshot, the other prisoners were either bewildered or agitated. Maybe they were overcome by the anointing of the psalms and the thanksgiving, but they heard these two maniacs who had been beaten, worshiping and praising a God that probably they didn't even believe in. And these guards listened to it. These guards that were both of a heathen God and possibly had some Hebrew faith as well, but didn't understand the living God. They heard this. And then God answered. He heard their prayers in that darkest hour, in that moment. How many of you know that when God brings a filling... It's from the bottom up, from the bottom up. How many of you put water in your bathtub and leave it in there and take 30 or 40 baths with it before you unlimp it? If you do, we'll pray for you and help you out. That's called dirty water. And what you do is you empty it out. How many of you have never cleaned or washed your bathtub? Hmm. You just let it be dirty for 10, 20, 30 years. Sometimes we have to empty out. Sometimes we need to be scoured and scrubbed. Sometimes it's with a Brillo pad against soft flesh of our soul and our heart and our spirit because we've got things that are so embedded, we don't want to let them go. I don't know about you, but there are things and people that I minister to, and at one point I was there myself, and I'd like to say I'm not at this point, but there were things that the Lord wanted to cleanse. He wanted to empty out. He wanted to get to the bottom of, but we didn't want to. We chose that we didn't want to let them go because it was easier to hold on to them, or we wanted to continue to practice that sin, or we thought it was a path of our own self-righteousness, or that a right that we had because of something that had happened or hadn't happened, we had a right not to forgive. We had a right to stay angry. We had a right to be rejected. We had a right to be afraid. So many things we could go on and count to that, couldn't we? But the redemption of God isn't to add fresh water to a dirty vessel. God empties the vessel out. And there's different levels of emptying. I'd like us to consider just a few of these people that we know through Bible history and just consider some of the things that they went through, but not in a long story basis. We don't have enough time for that. But more so in an understanding of what are the themes that we can grasp from it. Well, one such theme, of course, we all point to right away when we want to talk about having to be tested of God and unjustly in some ways tested of God. It comes out of the book of Job, as you probably guessed. And also you may or may not know that many believe that this was literally the first book that was written, actually that was covered. I don't know how many of you know that. And in that stead, what happened was that Job showed the test between evil and good. And it was the first revelation that God is not necessarily provoking evil. But at the same time, God wants to know, can we glorify him in the midst of our suffering and our pain and our problem? And the theme, the victory for Job was that he never let go, even though he wavered, even though he got at the point where he wondered how did this happen to him and how much worse could it go, he held on to the final fact. Isn't it interesting that if we hold on to our faith and there's nothing else left, then we have everything that we need 
to survive. Sometimes all the other things have to get out of the way so that it's just literally you and the Lord. Even in the dark, you're seeing the light. Job was a, compu- a, a peculiar fellow, and we would do well to learn that he had some, he thought they were good friends, and they sure loved being in his confidence and in his company. I would assume that as wealthy and as successful as Job was, that he probably blessed them rich, richly. They found that when they were in his presence and in his place that there was plenty to eat, plenty to go around. I'm sure he was a generous person. I'm sure they appreciated the fact that he could share with them about his God, etc. But we also need to understand that they were some of his worst detractors, and they gave him some of the biggest problems that he had because they were trying to interpret his relationship with God to him. They were trying to interpret his situation through their own lens. Sometimes we have to be so careful about what we listen to and who we hear. They might intend to be well, but they may not know. And the situation is, is what is the environment? Where is our head at that point? What is the environment? Is it one based on physically, empirically, what we see, what we sense? Is it based on what we know or the past experiences so that our expectation of the present now is somehow obscured by what happened in the past? How many people have you heard already surrender and say, I, this is my fate, this is what's going to happen, this is what's always happened? We have geneticists who are very smart and they want to tell people that because their grandmother and their great-grandmother and their parents and maybe some of their siblings had a peculiar to special disease that they're going to have it too. They mean well because it's the way they see, but that's not what we believe and receive if we're walking in the spirit and the power of God. We know that just because we might have been raised in a poor home, it doesn't mean that we are slaves to poverty. It might mean that we've been rejected or abused, but it doesn't mean that we need to continue to be rejected or abused or, worse yet, reject or abuse our own loved ones and children. There are curses that are placed upon people, and we can receive them or we can release them. It's what lens, what eye are we looking from? And there's really only one firm foundation. It's, it's, a, it's a mantra of this ministry, and that is the firm down foundation of the Word of God. We must know and understand the Word of God, and then not only know it and understand it, but confess it and declare it and thank God for it. That's what I encourage you to turn to. Job showed us, the book of Job, that there's an enemy in this world that hates God's people. How many of you know that? Do you understand that? Many times when I'm talking to people, especially when they're having difficulty in relationships, and we have to remind ourselves, don't we? Even though I might agitate the the very joy out of my wife, I'm still not her enemy. I'm still not her enemy. And your enemy is a spirit. Your enemy could be flesh and blood if you paint that name on a face. But then you're stuck with that name on a face and you're not going to win. You have to understand who your enemy is. He's invisible if you let him stay invisible. Huh? He's invisible if you let him stay invisible. There's something about the spiritual world that tends to just always amaze me. How many of you know that demons and principalities and powers confess themselves? How many of you know that? Hmm. You need to know that. You need to have that discernment. You need to listen what comes out of the mouths and the detractors of people and things. And you will see behind it the strategy of a spiritual force. 
It's not every word. Don't over-spiritualize everything. But when you're dealing in a situation, a situation that you know is vile, a situation that your spirit begins to tell you isn't right, listen for that enemy to expose itself. For those of you who've ever been through a deliverance or experienced a deliverance or watched one, I can tell you that I do not enter in to that environment without having already commanded and declared that every demon, every principality must expose itself to me by name. And they do, you see, because we have the power to bind and we have the power to loosen. Now, we don't need to get into that whole science, if we call it, of deliverance right now, but it is good for you to have a practical tool. And that practical tool is very simply, Lord, show me the light. Show me what it is that I'm truly, truly up against. And Father, have that force that's against me, whatever it is, wherever it's at, have it expose itself to me. Because when you understand the enemy, then you know the strategy. And so that's something that God wants his people in this hour, in this day, to know. You know, Joseph is another one, isn't he? He had the mistake of sharing gleefully a dream with his brothers, and they were already upset with him because he was the youngest and his father's favorite, and they couldn't understand it. And he got this beautiful coat. How many of you know a coat can get you in a lot of trouble? (laughs) He got this beautiful coat, and it had all kind of colors about it. And if you think about it, I don't think it was dyed. I think that coat was taken from many different animal skins and skillfully woven together and put together so it didn't just happen because somebody went to the laundry and somebody got, found some nice stitching and put together different patches of, of clothing on it. I believe it was meticulously hunted. I, I believe that it had real value because it had a story behind each and every patch. And I believe also it might have been a cloak that was intended for the father, but he put it upon the son, which basically showed his brothers that there was a favor that was upon this young boy. And where did it get him? It got him in a pit, but it wasn't a snowy day, but he was still in the pit. They threw him in a well, and that well, he ended up getting rescued, but he didn't get rescued back into his home in a situation he wanted. He got rescued into slavery taken to a faraway land, so far away that his father could only believe he was dead until they were repatriated at his father's last days. And then after he got there and he began to get favor because he was a good, hard-working, smart Hebrew boy, he ends up in a situation that probably he might have had a little to do with. You know, I know the scriptures make him sound totally innocent, but You know, sometimes in those situations where we're challenged and tempted, maybe it's because the very first time we were in them, we didn't run like we were supposed to. And so what happens is his master's wife puts the moves on him, and he runs. Well, they would like us to think, and I think maybe it's partial of it, that he ran out of his great moral character, but I think he also ran out of fear. Because if he had had an affair with his master's wife, what do you think would have happened to him? Back in the well or worse. But it happened anyway. Finds himself in prison. And in prison, his skills begin to show. And he helps a baker to get out, and he helps the wine tester, and everybody, he blesses everybody, and they make a covenant and a pact, and they forget him. And he stays in jail in a place he doesn't understand. Another trap. How many of you can think in your life and wonder, I was rescued from this trap only to end up in another trap? Huh? Yeah. How many of you have said you've run into a church? (laughs) Let's, Let's just pick on ourselves. You've run into a church to have your wounds healed and to have some love, to not be judged. To have people just accept you for who you are and you found out that it wasn't working that way in that place. Am I the only one? I pray this isn't that kind of a place. My prayer all the time is, Lord, let us be a house of love. Let us have more grace than we could possibly ever imagine. Let us be a safe refuge. Let us be a place where anybody and everybody 
can feel that they have a place to be safe in, a secure place, a place that knows that there's a whole bunch of losers coming together that have become victorious in Christ. Amen. Once we were blind, but now we see. Once we had lost, but now we're victors. Amen. I told you before, I just cringe when I hear testimonies from people that told me they never had a problem, a failure, a sin, a lust in their life. They were the children of pastors, and they were saved before they were out of the womb. And I, boy, oh boy, oh boy. I already know that's not true. Everybody has their issues and their tests. But we see that with Joseph, and maybe this will help you, because it's helped me, that every one of these dark hours, even though it might have been light, you know, when, when you're released from something like that, when he got out of the well, he was probably happy. He didn't care how he got out. He was just happy he got out. He had no understanding what the slavery was about to happen, but that was a better course than dying in the well, right? But after he was in slavery for a while, the pain and suffering of the well went along and was gone, and now he was pain and suffering from the slavery. But in each situation, he gained wisdom and strength, and his faith continued to grow because in each one of those situations, it was only he and the Lord when it was all said and done. Not even his gifts delivered him. Think about that a moment. Not even his gifts delivered him. I think about what Daniel said about, and I believe we're in this hour and this time, that, that men and women, people of great understanding would fall in this hour, that they might be cleansed and purged and turned white inside with righteousness. Beloved, there are some big ministries right now that are shaking. I can't share the names. I won't do that. That's between God and them. But just because you see a face on television, don't think everything is hunky-dory. Some big ministries right now have some big issues because God is turning people inside out. And he gets to the bottom of it. And even though we'd like it to just get skimmed off the top and continue on as if nothing happened and we keep a little secret in the closet, God takes it all the way to the bottom. And in that bottom place, he begins to refill. Joseph, I'm sure he wondered many times, why did this happen with all of his gifts? Jeremiah, how about Jeremiah? He's the one that they said he had fire. Fire of God shut up in his bones. That's how powerful he was. What did Jeremiah get for it? He was rejected, right? You know that. He was mocked. He was put in stocks. He was thrown down a well also. But through his story, millions of Christians have held on to scriptures. My plans and my purposes for you are good. Many things have happened. Jeremiah shows us something else that we need to understand too. When people are persecuted and when it looks dark for a little too long, there's a tendency to get mad with God, isn't it? I mean, it's only natural. Lord, you can do everything. How come you're not doing this? Am I the only one that's ever said that? Am I the only one who's ever wondered? Huh? Lord, you can do everything. I already believe. I have the faith to believe you can do whatever you want to do. But how come you're not fixing this? This is getting old. I'm trying not to be angry, God, but what else can I do? Read Jeremiah 20. God, Jeremiah was mad at God for having put that call in his life. He ended up saying, why'd you call me into this? Couldn't you have done something else? How about Pastor Jeff? Why can't he be doing this? Why do I have to do it? How about so-and-so? They're much more equipped than I am. Why do you put this on me? Am I the only one? Hmm? So we find consolation in that. And at the end of the day, Jeremiah accepted that God knew him from the womb and called him from the womb. I want you to understand something. God is not surprised by your life story. God has called you from the womb, but he's already made a way out of every situation for you. How about John the Baptist? I mean, if we didn't know the whole story, we would just think the fact that it was a horrible, 
right? A horrible, senseless tragedy that he got his head cut off, decapitated for not really doing anything wrong, just preaching the word of God, maybe to the wrong person at the wrong time. How many of you have ever done that? Hmm? Got his head cut off. But yet we understand that he said he was the greatest prophet there ever was because in that darkness, he was preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. Beloved, it's true what it says in Isaiah. Arise and shine. Gross darkness is covering the earth, but the glory of the Lord is upon you. You should expect and be prepared to have to minister into the light out of the dark. That's who we are. And so our personal situations are preparing us for the bigger situations. God has a mega kingdom plan. And all of our little plans, they merge into it some way, somehow, something special. Now, I don't want to leave you hanging by your fingernails on a cliff saying, oh my God, is it going to get worse for me? It's not going to get worse to the point you can't overcome, and it's going to get to those situations where you're going to call upon more power, more love, more grace, more word of God, more people that understand and walk with you to overcome faster. We need to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. If your testimony is, I'm still stuck in the pit with a lion, you're not overcoming anything. If your testimony is, I killed that lion, and by the way, I used its tail and threw it up above for somebody to pull me out while I rode up on his head. That's your testimony. So I want you to, to be encouraged that God has put you in a place to be successful with victory. That's the time that you live in. And now it's your time to say, Lord, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to begin to believe you for the victory. And I'm not even going to tell you how to do it, Lord, because I messed it up getting into it, and I'd mess it up getting out of it. Father, I'm going to believe you. I told you before, my friend Rick Joyner, you call him on his phone, and you get the cell phone. He never answers the phone, by the way. He'll always call you back. I've told him, I don't even know why I call you. I should just text you. But he says in it, this is the day the Lord has made, don't mess it up. And that's what we do very well, don't we? We mess up the things of God. Of course, I'm the only one there too, and I understand it. And, and, and I hear from God, and I know it's God, and I want to get ahead of God. And I want to make it happen for God. And then I find out God's saying, no, 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 no. Every time you think you're going to do it, let me show you how I'll embarrass you and humble you a little bit more. But Father, I thought I was pretty humble. I see inside deeper than you are, son. You need a little bit more. I gotta get the Brillo pad out and scrub that spirit a little bit more and let it bleed a little bit more. But in the meantime, I'm gonna fill you with a little more balm and a little more salve. I'm gonna bless you just a little bit more. And then of course, Jesus. Isaiah told us he was coming. And he didn't tell us that he was going to come on a white horse with all of the heavenly host with him. We got that from John in Revelation about the second coming. The first coming. Here is a man of sorrows. A man acquainted with grief. Rejected by his own family. The shame of his own hometown. They gossiped about him being Ill illegitimate. Jesus went his whole life with illegitimacy, the title of bastard over his name. Jesus, hated by the religious leaders, the ones that he came, that they prophesied about, that they studied about. They hated him. They killed him. Tortured, beaten, falsely accused. And this was the path of the incarnate Son of God. And most of all, He chose it. He endured it. So that I can. He did that for me. He did that for you. He could have just looked from the heavenly places and given us the word of God. That would have been enough, I think. I don't know. But instead He came. He endured the temptations. He endured the sufferings. They mocked him. 
He knew he could get off the cross. He knew he could call legions of angels. And they seemed to know it too. If you are the Son of Man, then call upon the angels. But he chose not to. But he arose victorious. And because he did, Paul can write to us in Corinthians and tell us that there's no temptation, no problem, that God will not deliver us out of darkness into light. Because Jesus made the way. Now the chapter's flipped again. And for some reason, God has anointed and blessed us to prepare the way for the Lord to come. There was only John. And now there's a whole school of Elijah's to prepare the way. And you're one. I'm one. It's a time of holiness. It's a time of calling. It's a time of jumping into the pit and saying, Lord, I'll dare. I'll risk. I'll go in because I know you'll get me out. It's a time of not just reflection. I'll be releasing a couple things this week. Scheduled for a interview with Charisma tomorrow. And then I'll be releasing something on POTUS Shield and probably through PC, TCT. I don't want to. You understand that? I understand, Jeremiah. I don't want to do this. I have to. I've said many times, Lord, why me? Why me? Let somebody else do it. You got a lot of people, they love to run and be published and do all kind of things. Why me? And I don't get an answer. But I'll tell you this. What I perceived and saw last week shot me out of my shoes and out of my bed. And I was surprised and amazed that the body of Christ hasn't said a word that I know about. God was mocked. God was taken out of our Pledge of Allegiance. God was challenged. No miracle. Well, God's about ready to throw the gauntlet down. It's going to be a Hezekiah moment coming in this country very shortly. We're going to declare it. We're going to announce it. We're going to birth it. We're going to write the letter and publish it as the priests of Hezekiah did. Hezekiah took it in to the prayer room in the temple. He laid it to the Lord. And the Lord said, I've heard. Beloved, I could give you scripture after scripture after scripture of things to encourage you in the moment of your darkness. You can find them yourselves. Read the Psalms. Read the epistles. Read some of the prophets. Read Isaiah 40, 41. God is your strength. He's your power. He says, when you're weak, I've got you. Do you understand where Paul got when I'm weak, I'm strong? He got that from Isaiah. It was prophetic. Paul knew the Torah. He knew the prophets. He knew the law. Strengthen yourself in the might of his word, in the power of his Holy Spirit. Tuesday night was a powerful night here. People at the altar. People getting bottomed out, getting filled up. But that's not it. It's not a one-time solution. It's a relationship. It's a lifestyle. It's a choice. It's a determination that says, I'm not going to let go. I want more. We can't survive and do what we're supposed to do 
unless we get all we can get that God has for us in this hour. Good word for those of you who've been waiting a long time for God to answer. He will answer. And when he does, it comes suddenly. And then it's as if it didn't happen after a while, but the, the grooming, the curing, the molding, it's all taken its place for the perfect work that God wants to do. I want you to be encouraged, but I also want you to be challenged. We can't get familiar. We can't just say we just want to have a church life because it fits our schedule and agenda. We have to pursue God like a lion on a wintry day and even jump in the pit. Risk it. Take it. Go the extra step. What's our fidelity to? What's our loyalty to? Make sure that you let nothing get in the way of God's call upon you. Nothing. Now, it doesn't mean you've got to run out and go do other things and things that aren't. Think about where you're at, what you're doing, and what you're supposed to do. I know too many people, they run all over the place looking for something else and they get nowhere because they're not doing what they can do where God has us. Even this day, I turn down most invitations because I'm where God wants me. Right where he wants me. And by the grace of God, we will do the best we can do with God has given us to do. And God will use it mightily in the kingdom of God. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Father, that you make a way. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our redeemer. We thank you, Jesus, that you must according to your own word. With you all things are possible. And you are the light of the world. We're not just looking at you through the dark, but we're looking with you as you're inside of us. Let your light overcome the darkness of our lives and of every environment that we're put into. Let us be the light. And Father, even if we must endure persecutions and injustices, strengthen us. Strengthen us. Because you also said, Jesus, that you are our strength. Strengthen us, O Lord. Thank you, Father for each and every person that's here and online. Bless them in the place that they're at. Encourage them, Father. Show them how to praise and thank you in the midst of the prison bars. Father, I declare and ask you to send a spiritual earthquake into the lives of all the people that cry out to you and say, Enough, Lord. I'm praising you anyway. Visit them even in the midnight hour of darkness right now, Father. Visit this nation in the midnight hour of darkness. Visit this world, O Lord. Shake this world with a spiritual earthquake, Lord God. Let it be gracious, Father, so that every eye must see and every tongue confess, even those that don't want to declare the Lord God of Israel. Let them have to say, That was something I can't explain. I don't understand it. Let it be a nudge and a move, Father. Let it break chains. Do it, Father. Do it, Father, not by the power and might of any system, of any man, but by your Spirit, O God. Shake it, Father. Let that Hezekiah experience come upon this earth and this nation. And Father... Father, I heard a man declare, there will be no miracle. My God, my God, my God, 
I declare there shall be a miracle. 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 Father, we believe in miracles, Lord, because you're the miracle maker, Lord God. And we believe, Lord Jesus, that in your name, in your name, it is done. And we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.